Hello, I'm Justin Briley and welcome to a classic replay edition of Unbelievable, in which Chris Sinkinson debates the late theologian John Hick on whether there are many paths to God. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more conversations that matter or listen via our weekly podcast. Subscribe to the Unbelievable newsletter and you'll never miss a thing and we'll even send you a free ebook featuring my conversations with thinkers like Jordan Peterson, Richard Dawkins, Paula Gooder and Tim Keller. The link is in the description. Enjoy the show. Hello and thanks for joining me, Justin Briley, here on Unbelievable for conversations that matter every Saturday on Premier Christian Radio and also via our podcast and YouTube channel as well. Hope you're well and enjoying these summer months, though my thoughts, of course, have very much been with those affected by that extraordinary and devastating blast in Beirut this past week. I actually have a friend out there, Said, who's a pastor in the sort of Beirut, Lebanon area, and uh, he WhatsApped me after that explosion and sent some Facebook images to just extraordinary devastation in their church and children's centre from the shockwave that took place. But they, they were actually incredibly fortunate. He had happened to have sent home all the staff early that day and believes there would have been significant injury or even death were it not for that. But um, you can actually see more of Said's um, story where they interviewed him out for the News website uh more stories and interviews there from others in uh responding to that um that that uh devastating uh shockwave that went through uh lebanon because of that explosion if you want more on that premierchristian.news is our news website uh, but here on the show unbelievable those long awaited conversations on black lives matter begin next week i'll tell you a bit more about that later on in the show And over the past few weeks, of course, we've been pulling some shows out of our vast archive. Classic replay stuff that you might not remember when we aired it first time around. Maybe you're a a recent listener to the show via radio, podcast or wherever. Well, today's show comes from 2011 and it's a debate I hosted between liberal theologian John Hick and evangelical scholar Chris Sinkinson on the question, Do All Paths Lead to God? Before I tell you more about them, though, did you know we have a regular newsletter? And would you even like a free ebook? Yes, you can have both because if you sign up for the newsletter, you get the ebook thrown in as well. Some of my favourite conversations with people like Jordan Peterson, Richard Dawkins, Paula Gooder, Tim Keller, Darren Brown. Um, you can find that newsletter and the ebook that comes with it at premierchristianradio.com forward slash unbelievable just click on the link there there's also a special uh, gift that coming your way if you're able to support the show financially as well all of the video sessions from our usa conference last year well on today's classic replay with chris sinkinson and john hick not only was it a great discussion on the question of whether all religions lead to god but it was also significantly one of the very last interviews that john hick gave he died less than a year after at the age of 90 and as you'll hear here john was a noteworthy theologian who became well known for his defense of a pluralistic view of religion well chris inkinson continues to be a lecturer in biblical and theological studies at moorlands as he was though at the time we recorded this he was also a senior pastor at older Alderho- holt chapel in dorset uh, and chris's own phd was on christian responses to world religions and in particular the theology of john hick which of course made him a very suitable discussion partner for this show so i do hope you enjoy this classic replay with chris inkinson and john hick you're listening to unbelievable with justin Briley. Well, thank you, gentlemen, both for being with me on the show today. It's a, it's a great pleasure to have you with me. And it's been a long time since we looked at this issue on the show, uh, but one which I think many people engage with, uh, whether they have faith or no faith um, in their lives. Um, the question, are there many paths to God? Uh, John, let me come first of all to you. Thank you for, for joining us by phone today. Um, John, you've had a very long and illustrious career in philosophy and theology, um, but Tell me, how did things start out for you? Did Would you say you're a very different kind of believer today to the one you, you began as? Uh, yes, I would, Justin. Um, it was when I first came to Birmingham uh, to uh, accept an invitation to a chair here in the university. 
that I became aware at first hand of uh, people of other faiths because Birmingham is a very uh, multi-faith city. As um, chair of the, the city's uh, community relations committee, part of my job there uh, was to visit places of worship so that I was in mosques and synagogues and uh, Sikh Gurdwaras and uh, Hindu temples, all these various places, as well, of course, as Christian churches. And um, something struck me very forcibly, namely that although the externals are very different, that is to say the, oh, the... Um, uh, the, the way in which the uh, building was furnished, uh, the pictures, the, the, the windows, and not only that, but the, the language used and the way in which God was thought of and, and um, referred to, all these things were very, very different. Yet nevertheless, it, it uh, struck me very forcibly that essentially the same thing was going on in all of them uh, as in the Christian churches, namely uh, human beings coming together under the influence of some ancient tradition uh, which enabled them to open their minds and spirits upwards, so to speak, uh, uh, and um, to find their lives uh, changed as they responded to the divine reality even though they, they thought about this in very different ways. And um, did this sort of lead you to the view that no one religion has the claim to the truth, that, they're, that all yes, religions are... Uh, I mean, I, in addition to that Birmingham experience, I uh, spent quite a lot of time in India with uh, Hindus and Sikhs and in Sri Lanka with uh, Theravada Buddhists and in Japan with uh, Zen Buddhists. So the result of all this experience uh, was, yes, I, it did become fairly clear to me that there are, in fact, many paths to God. Well, we're going to be obviously looking at that very question today, and um, you're not without those who differ significantly from you on that, John. Um, today with me in the studio is Chris Sinkinson, uh, as I said, pastor of a church near Salisbury. Uh, and Chris, tell me a little of your background. Um, obviously, John's been on a journey which... In, in those days in, in Birmingham made him reassess his views of the Christian faith and other faiths. Um, have you always said you've been a Christian and has your view of God changed at all in that time? Well, I would say I became a Christian when I was a, a sort of late teenager, but it would be fair to say that I was brought up in a, a sort of nominally kind of Christian background, so that was always part of the kind of culture that I was brought up with. Uh, I was more exposed to the world religions at university, as many of us have been as students, first at Southampton and then more so at Bristol, where there's a very strong uh, interreligious community and movement in, in Bristol. And it's been my experience over the years, and uh, increasingly so, that the question of whether all paths lead to God is probably one of the most pressing questions that Christians and evangelicals face. And that was certainly what I felt as an undergraduate student in philosophy of religion, that uh, this was a really important question. Uh, it was a question that not only Christians have to address, but of course orthodox believers of whatever faith have to address the problem of the outsider and those who, who don't belong, the problem of eternal destiny and salvation. And with that in mind, when I came across John Hick's work, I found him uh, enormously helpful, not for the answers he gave, which I still don't agree with, but for the questions he asked, I think that John has asked the right questions. And uh, I might also add the way that he's written in philosophy is uh, extremely clear and comprehensive. And certainly as an undergraduate student, he inspired my study of philosophy of religion. Most of the authors I was reading at that time were a little dull. And uh, I found uh, Professor Hicks' work, you know, really inspiring. So I went on to study at a doctoral level on this question and uh, Bristol University, as I say, a very uh, multi-faith, multicultural society. But I, what I found is that believers from other faiths also had very orthodox and often quite exclusivist views. Uh, that includes from Muslim and from Buddhist backgrounds. So my experience was not that we should adopt a, a pluralist view of the world religions. Now, 
There are so many questions that arise, um, just branching off from this question of are there many paths to God? And we're going to explore them as, as we continue in the program. And uh, if you're listening and, and you've got a question or a, a comment during the course of today's program, you're welcome to email it to me. And I do try to send on any relevant emails to the guests who have contributed in a given program. So the email address is unbelievable at premier.org.uk. You can also phone and leave a voicemail message. That's 08456 52 52 52. And uh, listen to the options and you'll be able to leave me a voicemail message for Unbelievable. Don't forget the podcast available now at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable and a vast a past archive of programmes as well. And I'll post up any that are particularly relevant to today's as well as as well as, of course, information on both my guests today. By the way, uh, John Hick, if you want to find out more about him as you're listening, uh, you might want to type into your Internet browser, johnhick.org.uk and uh, lots of articles and links to the books he's written there and um, we'll get uh, some information about more on Chris as well that we can put with the podcast of this program Uh, premier.org.uk slash unbelievable let's get into today's discussion as we ask are there many paths to God unbelievable with Justin Brierley Well, as we go, gentlemen, I'd, I'd really like you to just, you know, treat this as a conversation between yourselves. I don't feel that I have to be the go between, but but maybe just to kick things off. Um, let me start again with you, Chris, and, and then John. John's response. I mean, the first thing that that many people might say, looking at it, someone like you who who believes that Jesus, let's say, is the way to God. You know, if if you believe what what Jesus says about himself in the Gospel of John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Isn't that an incredibly arrogant claim? You know, how can you claim to have some monopoly on truth when, as John has described, there is such a plurality of views of God in the world? What, what, what on earth gives you the right to claim that you know Jesus is the, the way? This assertion is, is often made, of course, that an evangelical or an orthodox Christian view is, is arrogant. And I think we have to be very careful here to distinguish what we mean in terms of arrogance, because I think there are two senses in which it can be used, and we can slip between the two if we're not careful. On the one hand, there's moral arrogance, which is wrong, and uh, it would be wrong to be uh, proud or boastful or dismissive or disrespectful. So a moral arrogance is clearly something to avoid. And I don't think for one minute Jesus would have encouraged moral arrogance. But that's distinct from what you might call intellectual arrogance. Again, I don't particularly want to defend the word arrogance. I don't want to use it. But sometimes the word slips into this meaning. Now, I think by intellectual arrogance, we mean something like uh, someone is making a claim, a bold claim about absolute truth or about truth which affects uh, all other people. Now, that intellectual arrogance, if we want to call it that, is something which actually applies to anybody who wants to make uh, statements of ultimate concern. And at that level, it would be true that I I would want to affirm very boldly and strongly claims to absolute truth. But then, so do orthodox uh, believers of any faith, and ironically, so too does Professor Hick. Uh, John Hick makes a very bold and forceful and, for many people, very persuasive case for the position called religious pluralism. And at an intellectual level, one could... And I'm sure that John has heard this this accusation made. Uh, one could describe it as an arrogant position to take. It certainly is a claim regarding the beliefs and faiths of millions of people all across the world down through history. Well, I mean, coming back to you, John, let's. there's a classic analogy people often use, um, which I've heard many times. Um, you know, it's it's the story of the three blind men who... Um, find an elephant and um, one feels the tail and says ah this is what an elephant is like it's it's long and wavy or something like that one feels an ear and says this is what an elephant is like it's um you know big and leathery and one feels uh, a foot say and says it's you know whatever a foot feels like on an elephant and then someone comes along and says ah but you all had you know a grasp of something but um actually the elephant is actually all all of those things together um Now, that's a rather perhaps crude analogy, but I think what Chris is saying is, isn't it just as arrogant to claim I can see the whole thing? I I can see what those three blind men 
can't see, which is the whole elephant in my view, and and that's just as much an exclusive claim as those who would say my grasp of the truth is the c- correct one. Yes, well, <laughs> I think this whole question of arrogance really is um, a rather unnecessary one. I mean, is it uh, uh, um, if you say two plus two equals four? Um, <laughs> you're saying that anyone who, who says that this is not the case is mistaken. And um, simply to make any statement is to uh, uh, claim that anyone who disagrees with it is, uh, is mistaken. And that's true right across the board, not only in theology but in mathematics and everywhere. So I don't think this really is the issue. I think the question is whether... Um, whether the, the claim that Jesus is the only way, based, of course, on that um, statement in St. John's Gospel I, that you quoted, I am the way, the truth, and the life, uh, whether that is true. And um, in my view, it isn't true. And, uh, and, and Jesus never said it. <laughs> um, I don't mean that it's not in St. John's Gospel. It certainly is. But uh, some modern New Testament scholarship, as you all both know, has uh, concluded that the, that uh, St. John's Gospel is uh, the, the latest of the Gospels to have been written. It's to be dated somewhere in the, the 90s of the first century up to the end of the century. And um, it's very unlike the other three Gospels in many ways, which we could, I could spell out if you want me to. Um, but um, the conclusion is that it does not represent... The, these are not words of the historical Jesus. They're words put into his mouth by uh, a later Christian some 70 years after the death of Jesus, um, expressing the theology of the church at the point at which it had um, come um, in this writer's part of the church and at this that period of time. So it's not a statement of Jesus. Jesus did not in my opinion, uh, regard himself as God incarnate or as the second person of a trinity incarnate, uh, but as a prophet in the tradition of the Hebrew prophets. Uh, John, uh, this is Chris speaking now. Uh, C.S. Lewis makes the comment that we should always be a little careful of statements along the lines of modern scholarship concludes. Uh, after all, we know that scholarship is a, a moving target and uh, scholarship develops in its view and in its interpretation of the material. And certainly in terms of New Testament scholarship, I understand entirely that you uh, have endorsed the, what I would understand to be the very radical New Testament views of, uh, for example, the Jesus Seminar, uh, John Dominic Crossan, and uh, theologians of that ilk. But that isn't the whole of New Testament studies, and nor is it the conclusion of New Testament studies. It's certainly one stream, and it's uh, what I would suggest is a quite a radical voice. But there's plenty of material to show that there's uh, a strong sense in which the Gospels can be trusted as very reliable early first century eyewitness accounts, or at least records of eyewitness accounts of the life and teaching of Jesus. And I'd want to go further than that and say that it doesn't all hang on when we date the Gospel of John and the teachings in the Gospel of John, important though they are. New Testament studies would clearly show that the earlier strands of the New Testament are in the letters, And what we find in the letters, particularly of Paul, is that in the earliest traditions, Paul is probably quoting pre-existing material. We would think of Philippians chapter 2 or Colossians chapter 1, sometimes referred to as hymns in the New Testament. Paul is quoting earlier material, and that earlier material that's there in the New Testament has the highest Christology of all, a very high view of who Jesus is and what he claimed to do. I guess as well, I, I would add to that, John, um, whether you dispute whether, you know, John is representing the words that Jesus actually said, um, does on, on another level, simply the fact that it is has been historically part of Christian understanding um, that the, the exclusive claims, if you like, of Christianity. Do, do you regard that as a, a mistake of Christianity? That's been a bad thing for Christianity. I mean, it's been pretty fundamental to Christianity for a long time as well. Yes, indeed, it has. And um, um, let, let me just say that I, I, I am not um, relying at all on the, the Jesus Seminar in the America. Um, 
or on any radical New Testament scholars, but upon the middle of the road uh, orthodox ones. I mean, the, the orthodox scholars do believe that Jesus was divine, but they've ceased to claim that Jesus himself taught that he was divine. But I do think it was a mistake, and um, you see, the, the term Son of God was a very familiar metaphor uh, within Judaism. Indeed, any extremely good and pious, outstandingly excellent Jew could be called, metaphorically, a son of God. It was a term of high esteem. And um, no doubt in, in this uh, metaphorical sense, uh, Jesus was a son of God, but so were many other people. And what happened in the course of several centuries was that the metaphorical son of God uh, turned into the metaphysical God the Son, second person of a, of a divine trinity. And that this was a very fundamental move, but in my opinion, a mistaken move. I have no problem, John, with the idea that there's development in terms of Christian theology. Of course, you remember in the year that you edited, well, that was published, the edited volume, The Myth of God Incarnate, C.F.D. Moore published The Origin of Christology, where he presents the argument for development, but not for evolution. I mean, the, the development of Christology is that, of course, there's reflection on the teaching and the, the works of Jesus in order to understand his identity. But that Jesus made claims about himself, which in a first century Jewish context were not simply metaphors of he is a, a, a person to be highly esteemed, but these were blasphemous in that context. Uh, we know that Jewish monotheism is very strong and clear, and in the first century, this is what was getting Jesus into such trouble with the authorities of the time. So I would suggest that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then if we go outside of the Gospels and we look at the letters, we can put together a picture of a Jesus who, while we may want to say didn't present the developed Chalcedonian uh, doctrine of the Trinity, certainly made claims about himself which were more than just he is a man to be esteemed. Otherwise, I'm really unclear why Jesus got into such trouble and why he got himself crucified? Well, I think the reason why he got into trouble and was crucified uh, by the Romans was that um, he was regarded as the Messiah uh, by a growing number of um, uh, Israelites at that time. Now, the Messiah, of course, was not a divine figure. Uh, he was God's representative on earth to bring in God's kingdom on earth which meant abolishing the Roman rule. And this, of course, was very alarming and um, uh, might well have led to riots and all manner of trouble. Uh, and this is why uh, the, the Romans um, felt it necessary to arrest and execute him. I mean, before we go too much further into the, the ins and outs of the Christology, and um, since we have spent some time discussing that, I'll, I'll post up um, a very interesting programme we had um, a year or two back now with, uh, uh, with a couple of scholars on this very issue um, and uh, with the podcast of this programme. I suppose I'd like to draw us back a bit, gentlemen, to more, well, if let's deal with the fact that this is the claim okay and 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 you know obviously you'll disagree as to to how it what what kind of claims jesus made about himself but but given that chris you do hold what might be termed an exclusivist position let me ask you first of all um you know what's your view do do you believe that people who don't as it were believe in jesus christ have trusted in his saving sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection do you believe that they are then not going to inherit eternal life well could i back up slightly and define the terms a little because okay. I, i'm not unhappy with using the word exclusivist but it is a like the word arrogance it can be a word that's uh, uh, rather misused it needs a little nuancing uh, christians uh, during the last um, 40 50 years have, have developed this kind of language of exclusivism or inclusivism or pluralism to describe the main theological positions uh, the main christian responses to the problem of the world religions now, in that spectrum of views, the exclusivist is generally considered to be someone who would hold that unless somebody professes personal faith in Christ, the Saviour and Lord, they'll be eternally condemned. Then there is an inclusivist position, inclusivist, which would argue that though the atonement, the, the work of Christ is essential for salvation, that could be mediated 
perhaps through the other religions or in some other way, by God to those who've never heard. Now, in that debate, I would certainly want to hold an exclusivist position because I do believe that the world religions have to be respected as independent and distinct from the Christian faith, and God is not mediating salvation through the world religions. However, it does not follow that God cannot in some way uh, make the means of salvation available through general revelation, through direct grace, into the lives of those who'd never heard. So I would be quite optimistic that there may be uh, clearly those who've never heard, children dying in infancy, uh, perhaps uh, certainly in Old Testament times, people who were sometimes considered Old Testament saints, uh, that is to say people within the Old Testament period who knew Christ in an implicit way without knowing his name directly, obviously, and without knowing the work of Christ directly. So Though I would hold an exclusivist position, uh, salvation comes exclusively through the work of Christ, that could be mediated in some way by God's general revelation and common grace. And what about you, John? Do, do you feel like... This seems to me a very, very strange mm. thing to believe. You see, if you look around the world, the uh, it, it's true of the enormous majority, the huge majority of human beings that uh, the religion to which they adhere, or, of course, against which they rebel, depends upon where they were born and by whom they were brought up. So that uh, anybody born to a Hindu family in India is extremely likely to become a Hindu. Uh, Somebody born to a Muslim family in, uh, in a Muslim country, or indeed in this country, is extremely likely to uh, become a Muslim, and so on, uh, with all the faiths. Now, um, it would be very, very odd indeed if uh, salvation is available only within one faith, even though it may be somehow, in some mysterious, surreptitious way, um, made available in 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 some diluted form, to people of other faiths. I mean, if, if you... Uh, here's an analogy. Um, l- let's think of uh, God as the sun at the center of the universe and the planets, including Earth, as, uh, as revolving around the sun. Now, according to inclusivism, which uh, Chris is uh, arguing for, um, the life-giving and uh, uh, health-giving warmth of the sun falls directly only on our planet, only on the Earth. Which which is, in the analogy, Christianity? uh, To the others. Or, if you like, if you prefer a a financial analogy, um, the the, the wealth of uh, divine grace falls upon Christians, and then trickles down in a diluted form to people of other faiths. Now, this, is, this could be the case, but it seems to me extremely odd and would need some very, very good reasons. And, and, and is, your, is your objection that this does not appeal to you as the way God would act in, in terms of a, a just, loving God? Yes, indeed. It, it seems to me not, not merely that, but incompatible with the, or stretching the idea of a loving God very, very thin indeed. I can understand that point. I, I can certainly understand that you would see this as an odd position. And, I mean, I, I, I would believe that in, in many respects the, the message of, of Christ can be a scandal, uh, can cause offence. Um, Paul certainly knew that in his letters to the Corinthians. The, the fact that we may find, if we look around the world, there's this phenomenological point that people tend to have the, the religion of their parents or their culture. Doesn't in itself have any logical value, does it, John, in terms of whether Christianity is true or not, or whether the exclusivist position is true or not? There's no logical point being made there, is there? Uh, well, it, it makes it, it puts the burden of proof upon the the uh, exclusivist or inclusivist uh, uh, evangelical Christian, I think he has an uphill task. Sure. In your analogy, though, of the Copernican Revolution, which you've used on, on numerous occasions, you place uh, God at the centre with uh, religions revolving around God. That would be 
a, a simple way of putting it. Now, as you've just stated your position, which I can certainly understand the persuasive force of it, it's because God is a God of love and mercy and kindness that we would expect salvation to be universally accessible. That's a fair point, isn't it? It's because of your view of the, the God of love. The problem is, as we unpack the position and where it leads, and this is why I admire the consistency of your thought, you take things to their conclusion. And that's why many of us have found your work as a philosopher so uh, rewarding. As you take it to its conclusion, what we discover is that, of course, to talk of a God of love is a very Christian understanding of God. This is a personal God, a God of relationship, a God who loves. But, of course, your position is that actually at the heart of the universe is not a God of love. It is a being, a reality that's compatible with uh, a God or no God, with a God of love or uh, a God who is non-personal. We are going to have to take a quick break, go to a quick, uh, quick break, and we'll come back with your response to that, John, in just a moment. You're listening to uh, uh, an edition of Unbelievable, uh, the show that gets uh, Christians thinking. As we asked today, are there many paths to God? And um, it's a, a great pleasure to have John Hick on the line, who is a, a well-known philosopher of religion uh, and a theologian, and um, has been a leading voice in the, um, if you like, the, the pluralist view of religion. Uh, opposite him and arguing against that view is Chris Sinkinson, uh, a pastor, apologist, and someone who has critiqued the work of John Hick. Um, find out more about both of them at the Unbelievable webpage, premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. And uh, do join us again in a couple of minutes' time as we continue to talk about are there many paths to God? What I want to invite Roger to comment on is why couldn't the mental realm include an infinite consciousness? It's too much like us. It's, it's too I mean, much like, like putting it like, <laughs> yes, like the Greek views of the gods in some sense. They were like too much like but us. They were finite. <laughs> and contingent here, we're talking about a metaphysically necessary source. I admire this noble aspiration to find the highest possible ideal. It's almost as if you're proposing a new religion to meet this new challenge. It's not a new religion. Yes. What it is is something that sits in the same place. Mm. It addresses some of the same needs, but it is not founded on the same principle. If the New Testament says that Jesus did X, Y, and Z, did he do it or not? I don't think it's a story that's made by committee. Am I going to have a later literary genius who comes up with a great story like this? Or am I going to say, no, Jesus is the genius, and somehow that story has basically been preserved? to Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Welcome back to Unbelievable with me, Justin Brierley. We're airing a few classic replays over the summer. And this is from our archive back in 2011 when John Hick and Chris Sinkinson got together with me to debate, are there many paths to God? John, um, Chris was uh, sort of outlining... Really, in response to you, um, what you've described as the Copernican revolution, if you like, um, in terms of religious thinking, uh, in terms of pluralistic thinking. Um, what's your response to, to, to Chris's response to you there? Yes, well, first of all, let me just um, complete the quote that you, you half gave. <laughs> Probably from the mangled somewhat. Sufi thinker, uh, Abdu uh, Rumi. Um, he said that uh, the lamps are many, but the light is one. And that's a very good way of expressing the pluralist um, point of view. You see, the, 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 there is just one light, uh, which uh, lights many, many lamps. And the many lamps are the religions, of course. So, But now, coming back more directly to what Chris was saying, um, I, I think... Um, all religious people of uh, every faith 
um, affirm that there is an ultimate reality, an ultimate transcendent reality. And um, our English name for this is, is God. Eng English word for it is God. God is the ultimate reality. Um, but there are different conceptions of this ultimate reality um, which have developed within the different traditions on the basis of uh, religious experience and all, but also all sorts of cultural factors. So that um, we have on the one hand the ultimate reality in itself and on the other hand different human uh, concepts of it uh, resulting in different human awarenesses of it. Um, so that uh, it, it's true that the ultimate reality is not in itself a loving God, but is expressed in many um, uh, penultimate uh, realities which are loving. I mean, the, the God of the Christian faith is a loving God, though uh, there are certain reservations to be made at some points there. Um, uh, but, of course, the, the Allah, which is the Arabic word for God, uh, is gra ever gracious, ever merciful, as the, every single surah, except one of the Quran, begins by saying, uh, ever gracious, ever merciful. And... Um, uh, the, on the other hand, if you go to a, a non-personal conception of the ultimate, such as the uh, such as in Buddhism, uh, certainly the the ultimate, the Dharmakaya, is not a loving person, but uh, is a benign um, ultimate reality within which we can find our own true life. Uh, well, I won't go on round all the different religions of the world. But uh, that is my initial response to what Chris was saying. But John, you would also accept that there are religions which are essentially, in Christian understanding, atheistic. So, for example, in Zen Buddhism, there would be a form of atheism. In fact, Paul Williams, who uh, you may know from Bristol University, recently published a book, The Unexpected Way, where he points out as a scholar of Buddhism that... In a Christian sense, all forms of Buddhism are atheistic. They deny the existence of a god as a Christian would define god. Now, what I worry about with your term ultimate reality and the way that's used is that while it speaks well of your consistency, it becomes such a lowest common denominator definition of the ultimate object of our worship that there is really no content to it. It becomes emptied of all meaningful content. I think in an interpretation of religion, you're... Uh, most extended work on this, you describe the ultimate reality as beyond good and evil, beyond personal and non-personal, and beyond loving and hating. Yes. You see, I think we have to accept, as, as all the, I would say, the most profound Christian and other thinkers other th have said in the past, um, God in God's fullness is beyond our understanding God cannot be def cannot be limited by any human definition. Uh, God is the ultimate mystery. In fact, um, he is he is beyond human definition, and um, this means that you cannot even say that God in God's ultimacy uh, is uh, is a loving person. It, it, it does strike me just, you know, and I speak now with my Christian hat on, as it were, John, uh, Justin, again, the, the presenter, that, that, you know, one of the things that is so attractive to many people about Christianity is precisely that it makes God personal. You know, it is about God revealing God's self in a person, Jesus Christ. And, and for, for many they will feel rather depressed, deflated at the idea that um, you have a kind of better view of God, which is actually far less personal, and which says actually, um, I, I don't see what, what then is better about the view, the pluralist view, if, if it actually strips away what actually is the identity, essentially, of, of Christianity. Uh, well, Christianity is one totally valid and extremely valuable way, uh, path to God, path to the ultimate. But it's not the only one, and um, 
thinking in terms of a, of a loving person is not the only way that appeals to uh, people in the world. It does not appeal to Buddhists, as you rightly said. I mean, they, they do not affirm that the ultimate is, uh, is a person. The problem arises... Um, ...a benign ultimate mm -hmm. in, uh, in which we can rest, on which we can rely, uh, and because of our belief in which we have uh, nothing to be anxious about, nothing to fear. Um, Buddhism is, a, is an equally profound religion, and of course an older one than Christianity, and it appeals to a different type of person. The problem arises when we come to contradictions, I think, John, between our conceptions of God. I, I'm you know, entirely happy with the idea that God is uh, more than we can express in words, but not with the idea that God ultimately could be something which makes our words uh, redundant or contradicts what we, we say about God. It's one thing to say we don't have an exhaustive knowledge of God. It's another thing to say that our, our understanding of God could be compatible with a contradiction and that I think is the problem with your description of the ultimate real of course you're able to draw upon and I know you do uh, a long tradition of uh, mysticism in the various traditions which would emphasize that the ultimate real or God is ineffable but the ineffability of God which means to say that we can't express in words what God is like if taken to its conclusion means we really are in agnosticism. Uh, you're sometimes accused, I know you would defend yourself, but you're sometimes accused of being a transcendental agnostic because when it comes to the ultimate real, when we step outside of our images... Well, I've the... been accused of almost... <laughs> well, I'm sure, but, but just on the subject of agnosticism, uh, you know, one can see why this, this point comes up, that your, your description of the ultimate real, so not our images now, not our, well, our idols or what we choose to worship, but the, the ultimate real in itself is beyond words, beyond language, and therefore we should be agnostic about what the ultimate real is. No, agnostic's the wrong word. That's, you see, that, that's appropriate when you have some definite idea and then you are agnostic about it. That is to say, you neither believe it nor disbelieve it. But that, that's not the right uh, word at all. Um, the ultimate... Uh, which is expressed in different ways within the different traditions, uh, is, uh, is entirely beyond human conception. Not just words, but uh, we don't even have uh, adequate concepts. Uh, but what this about, reality I, is there. Can I throw in one other word? We, we've talked about not you know, being beyond loving and hating, good and evil. What about the word existing? Is it right to say the ultimate real exists? Well, as, as Tillich pointed out, it, it depends what you mean by exist. If you mean part of the, uh, the universe, uh, then as Tillich also pointed out, no, God does not exist. He is not part of the universe. He is um, the ground of the universe, uh, the ultimate reality. I mean, what, what interests me here, John, is that, in a sense... Um, obviously, you, you you see that this is somehow, pre presumably, um, from your point of view, um, obvious to you that this is what God is. Um, it, although when you dig down to it, obviously, that's significantly different to how a Muslim, a Hindu or a Christian or whatever m might have in their mind when they speak of God. Um, now, you, you say that, well, a Christian, a Hindu or a Muslim they have a different expression of God leading them towards this. Uh, are you saying, though, that, that ultimately they're all wrong in the sense that you are right? Uh, that, that's the question, because it, it, it's great to say you, you have, a, you have a, a grasp, an understanding, an expression of God. But are you saying at the end of the day, actually, you're wrong and I'm right? <laughs> um, they're all right. <laughs> Can they all well, be right? They're, they're saying very they're, different things, aren't they, about God? Say they, they have their own authentic path to the ultimate, which they follow and which um, can lead to their uh, ultimate uh, good. Um, so, so in that way, they are all of them right. I think John's dis distinction he made earlier is uh, really important here to understand the pluralist case, which is a distinction between the outward forms, what John called the outward forms, 
and the perhaps inner experience or the inner response to the ultimate real. That distinction is important, I think, because for John, the outward forms, whatever they may be, the, the doctrines, the practices of religions, if they are treated as in any way absolute or authoritative, they are wrong. The inner experience or moral transformation, which John believes is shared uh, equally among all the major world religions, that is what is right. That's fair, isn't it, John, to your position? Uh, yes, that's correct. The, the, I mean, if, if you regard the doctrines, let, let's take Christian doctrine, the doctrine of the Trinity as an absolute truth, then I have to say that I, I don't think it's that at all. I think it's a humanly constructed uh, idea, uh, and I, uh, we can trace exactly why it was constructed. You see, if um, you started out as a Christian theologian believing that Jesus was God on earth, then you have God on earth and you have God at the same time in heaven. That's two. And when you add the inner sense of the presence of God, you have three. And so you have the Trinity. So it's a defensive doctrine. Well, I, I, the doctrine of the incarnation. I think I'd argue about how the, how the doctrine of the Trinity was formulated. But if we put together the doctrine of the Trinity, the incarnation of Jesus, the possibility of verbal revelation from God, uh, the atonement, uh, belief in angels, you know, all of these, these doctrines you would say are very much secondary. Uh, all of them are in some sense metaphorical, and none of them are essential to the real no, nature of faith. They're metaphorical. I say they are human constructions. Okay, well, well <laughs> human constructs. But... And, and there are many other alternative human constructions mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. the world. Now, I would say that if you take those things away, and that is what you're doing if you describe them as human constructs rather than revelation about the way things really are, if you do that, you've really emptied Christianity of its content. It's no longer Christianity. Uh, what you're left with is a message about the existence of an ultimate real, which would be one uh, fact, uh, the need for moral change to be good people, that that's perhaps what salvation really all comes down to. Now, that's legitimate as your belief, that I would understand is what you believe, but that isn't Christianity, uh, nor is that Islam, nor is that Hinduism. That's a very reductionistic approach to religion, where you see all of those doctrines as just like the packaging. And, and the would trappings. you say, uh, something I understand you believe, Chris, is that, that John's approach is actually doesn't do good in terms of religious understanding and tolerance, because it actually, in some sense, reduces religion. It doesn't... Um, allow people to believe what they believe in that sense. Yeah, uh, no, I mean, I wouldn't want to make this a personal <laughs> comment about John, who has done a great deal in terms of um, uh, his, his work in anti-Semitism in the 1960s and uh, interfaith relations. I mean, I know he's done a lot of good work in those areas. I'm not making a, a personal comment, John. But in terms of the implications of the religious pluralist position, I'm certainly very concerned that the cash value of this position is that the only way in which we can create a tolerant society is by coming to a, an agreement at the philosophical level of what our beliefs really come to. It's a kind well, of... No, that's not, that's not the only way. <clears throat> um, I mean, we, we have a relatively tolerant society uh, uh, in this country now. And um, uh, what it amounts to really is that in practice, uh, then if you're living next door to a Muslim family, let us say. In practice, you simply respect their different beliefs without uh, necessarily inquiring too much into them. Um, but the Muslims, uh, sorry, John, I mean, the Muslim friends I know, uh, and I know that there's a breadth in Islam as there is in Christianity, but Muslim friends I know are absolutely persuaded of, of the truth of Islam and that the yes, Quran is a revelation. Yes, no, no, but they're still friends. And I mean, we have some lively chats. And I think uh, some folk from a more uh, Arab culture can be far more uh, aggressive sometimes in their debating than, than we are in our more woolly West. But nonetheless, we can yes. share absolute commitments that our doctrines well, are not I the trapping. I suggesting for a moment that, that Muslims... Um, do not have very emphatic beliefs. They certainly do. But, um, um, I mean, it seems obvious to me that uh, if you believe that all these, all the religions are valid paths to God, uh, this must make for mutual tolerance. Well, on only 
it's only tolerance on the grounds that you've reinterpreted those religions to fit with your framework. I mean, I don't agree with my Muslim friends and I don't agree with uh, those who are orthodox of of any of the other world religions. But I do want to respect them. I certainly don't want to cause them harm. I would like to be a good witness in the way that I show uh, love and share my faith. And I'd humbly admit that I might be wrong on various things. But all of that comes from a position of saying that we fundamentally disagree. Your position is to commend being able to live alongside each other because we reinterpret what they are saying or doing to fit with Uh, our uh, philosophical position. I take them as um, unitary positions um, uh, which have their own own validity in that they do lead lead to salvation, to... uh, to uh, human good, human ultimate well-being. But you see, there are many different kinds of Christian. You are, uh, as you've explained, uh, an evangelical Christian. Now, I am a Quaker, and uh, Quakers do not emphasize beliefs. They emphasize life. Um, The reality of their faith is in the way they live. And uh, as you probably know, Quakers have long been famous for their... Um, their practical service to the community in so many different ways. Um, that, that's still, in, its sense, in a sense, though, an exclusive claim, is it not, John? I mean, it's saying we believe we have the truth, and that is that it's about life, it's about shared human values, it's about, you know... And that's fine. I'm, I, I, I'm sure that, you know, it leads to very moral living, but is it not just as much an exclusive claim as the muslim who says you know allah is god and muhammad is his messenger or the christian who says that jesus is god incarnate and died to save us from our sins i mean they're all making exclusive claims you included well this word exclusive you see is very odd um i mean if you say that two plus two equals four is that an exclusive claim well, it, yes. it's obviously a claim very few people would <laughs> differ from, but it's, it, it is, in a sense, an exclusive claim, yes. Yes, it, it is, because in the sense that um, in, in saying that 2 plus 2 equals 4, you're saying that anyone who, who doesn't agree with that is mistaken. Hmm. But, so there's nothing necessarily, to go back to a, something we were discussing earlier, nothing arrogant in um, making a statement which you believe is true, and therefore those who don't believe it are mistaken. What, I suppose what I'm trying to get at, though, is what then gives you the grounds for saying my belief is the true one, whereas y- you, you believe Chris is sincerely mistaken? I, I suppose, uh, you know, you obviously believe Chris, for various reasons, is mistaken. Well, On what do you ground your, if you like, views then, which, you know, find themselves manifested in the belief in shared human values and that salvation is ultimately manifested in uh, groping towards this, this ultimate good? I mean, what makes that the correct view upon what do you base that well, I, I don't see salvation as a yes or no thing you know are you saved yes or no i see it as um uh, progressive um uh, as um a growth in um spirituality and in the spirit of service of humanity could could and we try uh, as this grows we are more and more saved, to use the Christian term. Could, could we take that word salvation a bit further? Because I think this is quite important that in a discussion like this, we use these words uh, assuming there's a shared meaning, when in fact there may not be quite the shared meaning we, we think. And the word salvation is a, very much a, a Christian uh, part of the vocabulary where we describe, as I understand it, when I use the word salvation, I'm describing how uh, we are people who face the wrath of God, we are sinners, we uh, need forgiveness and the grace of God, that Jesus Christ came into this world to die on the cross for our sin, to bear a, a penalty, a punishment for us, and that through his resurrection he conquered death and brought about a new life that can be ours. Now, that's a very Christian-defined uh, view of salvation. And the and emphasis... It's a very evangelical <laughs> well, 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 I don't believe a word of that. <laughs> well, no, exactly, Even exactly. And, uh, God, and that we're yeah. all doomed to, uh, unless we should be but, but I want to by the miracle of Jesus' uh, <laughs> death on the cross. Sure, but I want the to... Idea, um, the idea that... Yeah, I want to bring it on the table. Because Jesus died yeah. is, to me, 
ridiculous. But I want to bring that to the table, John, because we, we can both be using the word salvation, but meaning something quite different. I mean, what I mean by salvation is, in your eyes, quite ridiculous. And though I, I may have put it in very evangelical terms, actually, I think that is a, pre, a pretty orthodox statement. Uh, I mean, we can go right back down through the history of theology to look at uh, various views of the atonement, but they share some sense of a an ontological salvation which Christ brought about through his death on the cross. Anyway, leaving that aside, in terms of how we define salvation, your your definition of salvation would be very much one of uh, personal moral transformation, that we should become better well, people. I, I don't actually want to use the word salvation at all, because it is, as you say, so, so mm. distinctively Christian uh, a word. Um, but you do use it. <laughs> I appreciate you don't want to, but you do use it in a, well, uh, an interpretation of religion. To, you know, <laughs> other people use it. But isn't um, this part of the problem, though, John? We we have to use these words because we are describing uh, religious realities, beliefs, things that uh, matter so much to us. And so salvation is right at the heart of the, the Christian message, and it's yeah, quite distinct I, 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 from I, yes, I know liberation. I agree, but that doesn't make it right. You see, you have a totally different concept that is the uh, Buddhist equivalent exactly. of salvation, which is uh, enlightenment. But because it's a totally different concept, we ought to be wary of trying to conflate the two. Though, in an interpretation of religion, again, one of your, your major works on this subject, you do conflate salvation and liberation. You, you put these together as common categories. But, but as you say yourself, they are identifying a quite different understanding. We're going to go to another quick break, gentlemen, and then we'll, we'll have a chance for just 10 minutes of wrap-up. Um, fascinating conversation thus far, and um, I'm, I, I've really opened my eyes to just all sorts of areas that, that uh, exist in, uh, in this um, whole question of whether there are many paths to God. What is God? Uh, what what would be the, the the content of the concept of God uh, in in that kind of view, a pluralistic view? Uh, John Hick has written a large amount and is a leading scholar in the area of um, a pluralist view of religion and philosophy. So uh, do check him out at johnhick.org.uk. Uh, Chris Sinkinson, as I said, is a pastor. He's a tutor at Moreland's College as well. Um, he's the author of the Universe of Faiths. Um, that's from Pater Noster, published in two thousand and one and um, that critically examines certain aspects of John Hick's work and um so, so great to have you guys with me today as we look at this question. Thank you very much. And, and if, if you're uh, wanting to find out more, um, just before we go to the break, let me say you're welcome to um, look in on the podcast and find out more about both my guests there at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. We'll be back in just a moment's time to conclude our discussion. If you listen to Unbelievable with Justin Briley on Premier Christian Radio and enjoy the conversations between Christians and skeptics, then this is the perfect app for you. For the latest updates, podcasts, videos, articles, bonus content and much more, download the Premier Unbelievable app today. You obviously have said you believe a particular view of God or the ultimate reality. You disagree. You believe Chris is sincerely mistaken in his view. I suppose what, yes, I'd like to know what the philosophical foundation of your view is then, why you believe it is true if, if Chris has been mistaken when it comes to un, the, believing that his view comes from direct revelation from Scripture and the person of Well, um, you see, uh, l- l- let me tell you what I don't believe to start uh, with. Okay. <laughs> I don't believe that um, uh, God is a wrathful God uh, and that uh, unless we, ha- unless his wrath is placated by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, that then we are all doomed to eternal uh, punishment. Um, I don't believe that God is a wrathful God, that the ultimate is a wrathful person. Uh, I don't believe that it makes sense to say that uh, we can be forgiven because somebody else is punished. I mean, that is an immoral idea, um, and I don't believe that um, uh, we have to believe that Jesus was, uh, Jesus was God incarnate. I don't think he himself thought that he was, or thought that he was, um, so that I, I'm a hundred miles, in fact a million miles away, from the evangelical Christianity of Chris. Um, and it's not for a philosophical reason, it's for, on the basis of uh, personal experience, experience of uh, knowing people of other faiths, 
of traveling in their heartlands, of getting to know what their religions are like on the ground and not just in books. Um, and it seems to me entirely clear that uh, in all these various places that I've been, in, in, amongst Hindus in India, Sikhs in the Punjab, uh, uh, Buddhists in Sri Lanka and in Japan, and so on, uh, it seems entirely clear to me that that uh, the paths that these people follow all very, very different indeed. Uh, I mean, you, you can't um, put them into a, a single uh, category. Uh, they're uh, very different though they are. All produce are equally productive of human goodness and saintliness. And that is the important thing. Um, the production of human goodness and saintliness. Grace. Well, John, of course, puts first his experience and uh, all of the things that he's described in his testimony there, which um, are obviously very relevant for forming his understanding of the world religions. But I would want to put first revelation and my understanding of God having spoken and revealed himself. Without revelation, I think I would travel that hundred million miles, John, <laughs> if I had no revelation from God and understood nothing of what God is like in terms of him speaking. Uh, if we were left with speculation rather than revelation, the pluralist option would seem very attractive. But the sticking point is that I believe in a personal God who would not leave us in the dark, but has spoken. And as the word of God, the Bible consistently tells a story, paints a picture, which in a very pluralistic world, and it always has been a pluralistic world, all down through the ages, God has revealed himself as a God who opposes idols, who will be distinct from the gods of human imagination. And therefore, whether we're talking about Moses and the gods of Egypt or the gods of Canaan, or indeed, very importantly for us, the first century gods of the Greco-Roman world, in each case, we find a very clear statement of a God who's revealed himself and is distinct from the gods of the surrounding culture. I find it remarkable, of course, that in the first century, Jewish monotheism was very strong. And, of course, the Jews of the first century could have had a lot less trouble if they just incorporated Caesar into their pantheon of gods. It wouldn't have taken much. They were not being asked to deny uh, Yahweh as one god among many. If they could have just endorsed the pluralist view, they could have had a lot easier life instead of suffering a great deal of the persecution uh, that they would, would then follow. So on the basis of revelation rather than speculation, I would hold to what I would still describe as an exclusivist position. Does that mean that God is a God of wrath? Well, no, that doesn't quite follow. God is wrathful. That's certainly in, in the revelation of God's character. But I think that sense of wrath is part of love, that God is a personal God, a God of love and wrath. And I'm sure, John, when you have seen footage from the Holocaust, you were angry at the Nazi perpetrators of the Holocaust. Well, surely a personal God of awesome love has every right to be wrathful at the evil of this world. But you said that God was wrathful against us, all of us, unless uh, we are saved by the blood of Christ. Well, God, God is wrathful against sin is the point that I was making. And I, and I think that you would, well, I don't know whether you would agree with this, but uh, I would like to think that you would agree that we have a right to be wrathful against evil. Uh, certainly we do, yes. And likewise, God, being all-knowing and all-loving, would have the right to be wrathful at evil. Well, if God is a, is a person... Uh, then yes. Yes. But I don't think that the ultimate reality is a person. I think that the ultimate reality is uh, uh, beyond both personality and impersonality. Uh, what, and in a sense, this is what you believe, John. I suppose I'm, I'm still slightly wondering why you know you come to that conclusion another person for instance uh, i have many atheists in this studio would say well i see the diversity of religion and all it tells me is there is no god at all um you know what 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 still gives you the foundation that there is an ultimate reality and we're all seeing it in different ways what what if you like well is ultimately that it's a matter of religious experience um uh, i practice a form of meditation every day um and uh, every now and again, very rarely, I get to the... Well, the, the, I mean, initially, the mind wanders like anything. Uh, but then, uh, with discipline, eventually you find that uh, the mind ceases to wander and becomes fixed on um, whatever it is you've decided to concentrate on. Your own breathing is the most convenient. 
uh, and then just sometimes there is a third uh, position, third experience, uh, which is an experience of uh, one's, one's being part of the universe, and the universe that one is part of is ultimately good, benign, such that um, there, is, there cannot be anything to fear or anything to worry about, but you are then free, liberated, or um, in Christian language, uh, saved. It's been so it's, it's based on, yeah. on experience. And, and I'm sure you would say that it's revelation and experience in your case that persuades you i certainly believe that experience is part of forming our, our, our beliefs and i would practice a, i suppose you might call it a form of meditation though i don't uh, meditate on my breathing but I, I do meditate on the word of god which i would understand to be his his breath and his word and so i think that there is obviously an important part that personal experience plays in in all our outlooks but i think in at this point in the conversation if we were carrying on we probably would have to go back to that uh conversation we started earlier on the reliability of the new testament because i really do think that our experience can be deeply misleading there are many people who have wonderful experiences which lead them to do some terrible things in the world and of course i'm not suggesting that john is in that camp but we know of many uh, religious enlightened supposedly enlightened people who their whose experiences have taken them into all sorts of flights and fancy and acts of wickedness but if our faith is rooted in revelation then I think our experience should be responding not to what we think or feel or how we respond to our breathing, but to what God has said and what he has spoken. And that's where my my religious experience would very much want to tie in with my understanding of God's revelation. So that conversation on the reliability of the New Testament, I think, is ultimately unavoidable. Mm. Well, it's been a fascinating uh, discussion and, and uh, very refreshing to hear both views um, stated so persuasively and, and uh, such a good, um, you know, discussion uh, across all the different sectors of, of where this takes us. And thank you for trying to do it within the confines of one show. There's so much more that could be said, of course, gentlemen. Thank uh, you very much. John, thank you for being with us on the line today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. And if you want to find out more about John and his work, as I said, johnhick.org.uk. Um, oh, cool. Uh, yes, or Google the name, you'll find uh, links. And could I just recommend John Hick's Philosophy of Religion, the second edition, which is a superb text. And as an undergraduate student, I owe my uh, continuing studies in the philosophy of religion to that, uh, that textbook. So I would just put in a word for John's book there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, your most recent, I understand, is entitled Between Faith and Doubt, Dialogues on Reason and Religion, John. Is that correct? That's right, yes. Well, um, uh, if you want to get hold of that again... Uh, do do look it up online uh, or indeed in your local bookstore um thank you again john for being with us um great to have you on and perhaps we'll have you on again in the future uh, if uh, the right topic arises and um chris thank you for being with us as well um great to have you with us thank and, you very much, and uh, i hope that uh, you'll come on again at some point down the line um, uh, Morlands College is where Chris teaches, and uh, if you want to find out about his book, it's The Universe of Faiths, published by Paternoster. Uh, I'll put a link as well with, to that with the uh, Unbelievable podcast. There's a forthcoming IVP book on okay. apologetics as well, which ah. I hope will be out and soon. Are you a contributor or the, the main writer? I'm an author. Oh, good. I'm an author. <laughs> All right, well, we'll get you back in on Thank for you. that then, Chris, because this Great. is really the what we deal with a lot of the time anyway um so so uh, do do check out those links uh, premier.org.uk slash unbelievable for more conversations between christians and skeptics subscribe to the unbelievable podcast and for more updates and bonus content sign up to the unbelievable newsletter